Yo, what's going on guys? Jared here. Today I have another deck profile for you and it is going to be a budget Flounderies deck profile. This deck, you can make this deck not budget by playing something like Triple Tactics Thrust and um, putting Arise Heart in the extra deck, but for now I'm going to keep this budget because I don't think those are exactly necessary, but just keep in mind that they are options in the deck. Um, but yeah, so this deck is coming to me after post the YCS Las Vegas. I have looked at a lot of the top lists. The tournament has concluded. And I think that this deck could legitimately see a place in the metagame. I don't think a lot of people are playing it right now with the loss of Barrier Statue, but I do think that there isn't a room for this deck to fit in because a lot of people are not prepared for it. And I don't think a lot of, like, a lot of people only play this deck as Barrier Statue Pass. Then there's very few players who actually understand the interactions and ways to force cards through the way that this deck needs to play and can play around a lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, um, enough, all that being said, if you enjoyed this type of content, feel free to subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. And let's jump into the deck profile. Okay, guys. So here is the deck list I'm going to go over. Uh, like normal, we're going to go through the card by card and I'm going to explain it as we go. And uh, some of the choices, there is some more techie choices in here that I want to explain. Again, this is coming post the YCS and going over all the deck profiles and what did well and their explanation. So there is a lot of theory coming out of that tournament. But um, again, feel free to make any changes that you want in this deck. I think that this is just something that could actually do very well if played, you know, played well. So um, going forward, we're going to have three copies of Eaglin, three copies of M-Pen, three Robina, one Street, two Toucan, one Avion, and one Ryza. Um, these ratios I like right now. I don't, I'm still not set on the two Toucan. This might be a second Street. I'm not positive yet. Without the Shufflers being really played right now, the second Street um, could come up more. But the Toucan is better for resource management and getting your cards back. Um, it's not as good as a starter, but you shouldn't really need it. But um, yeah, that's just something to consider. The three M Pen I like right now. With the loss of barrier statue, you need more wing beasts to play as well with um, the Advent Adventure. But you're also trying to grind your opponent out very well. And this deck can really, really make it awkward for your opponent. And end pen right now is extremely powerful just because of the fact that your Kashira player, if they're playing into it, they have to put all of their cards in defense to be able to activate and resolve them. And if they're putting all of their cards in defense, that means they're not killing you. And this deck excels at the grind game because, as you know, all of the flu cards get an infinite recursion effect, just how they work. So the longer the game goes on, the better it is for you because you can just grind them out. And M-Pen being such an oppressive card is just crazy. And the battle effect is super relevant for this card too. Being able to, not, pretty much not being able to kill it in a battle is just ridiculous. So um, it's just an absolutely crazy card. Um, and yeah, that's it for the monsters. Ryza is really good right now in this format. That's all I'm going to really say about it. It's, it's card, this card just crazy. Um, I'm considering a second one to infinitely loop them. But um, for now, I think one is just fine because you can brick on too many tribute summons. Um, now we're going to get into the more like the techie cards, which is three Book of Eclipse and three Book of Moon. It is very obvious right now that Book of Eclipse is a very powerful card in the current format against Kashtira. And even against Branded with their fusion boards, the, um, you can still Book of Eclipse them. And then uh, three Book of Moon, like you just need to be able to turn off all the interruptions that you can before resolving like Rubino, Eaglin and being able to try to play. And these cards do an exceptional job at that. And now as a double for this deck, you can also use these to book down your own cards to be able to dodge things like Imperm and Valor. That's something that a lot of people I feel like forget about. So being able to, I've done this multiple times too on DV, like where you can dodge stuff. So it's really, really good in that aspect as well. So I really like these cards right now. They're good against the meta and it's like perfect for dodging a lot of cards as well. And then we obviously have the three copies of the Advent Adventure and the Magnificent Map. Um, yeah, these cards are just like really, really good. Like there's nothing really much else to say about them. Um, they're just consistency and craziness. Uh, yeah. So obviously this card can dodge Impermanent Veil or two. So you have like a lot of ways to dodge cards like that. Um, it just plays into the meta very, very well. Also like Arise Heart and Fenrir both target. So you can use Advent to like, uh, just banish the card that they are going to target with it in the chain link. And then you can just keep going that way as well, which is super strong. And then if they use like, if they have a Rise Heart up especially, you can, uh, get like Toucan, and then you can just add back this back to your hand with the Toucan because it'll get banished because of Rise Heart being there. And then it's just, it's just crazy, man. It, like, it's really, really good. Um, and then obviously maps crazy. This card, I think I almost want to bump to two for going second. I think this is just like an absurd card because your opponent has to respect it no matter what. So like, I might even put a second one in the side deck. I'm not positive just for the, like, just for the sheer fact that you can go like activate this card, summon bird, and then their board is immediately threatened with that without even like, really committing anything like it's so crazy how how much a pre like pressure this card applies but for now i'm going to leave it at one i think that the only way i would play more of like main deck more of this card is if i cut the pot of prosperities and i know i'm i know what you're probably thinking like I'm, I'm skipping around a little bit but for the prosperities i know i said budget and i know this card is worth like a good amount of money right now but i genuinely think 
that this is, if you're playing flu, that this card is a staple. Like you cannot play Flunderies without this card being in your deck list because just for consistency reasons, right? Like this deck is almost in a tournament setting. I don't want to say like unplayable, but it's pretty damn close to not being as good as it can be without this card. So I would really recommend having this card. I think this is a card that everyone should own anyway, just because of how diverse it is in every single deck. Um, but yeah, I know you're probably mad at me for saying budget with this card in the list, but I promise you this card is just absolutely worth it and it's mandatory for this deck specifically. Um, so going back now um, to two copies of Forbidden Lance, with a format where cards like Dark Hole and Book of Eclipse seem to be very important in this meta, Forbidden Lance has a very strong place in this meta. Um, being able to protect something like your M-Pen is super, super strong from things like Book of Eclipse, Book of Moon, from, and uh, Dark Hole. And then even if it's like lower, if it's at 1900 attack, it doesn't really matter because M-Pen can't be destroyed by battle. So like even if it's just sitting there and they try doing something, like this card is just huge. It's ridiculous how good M-Pen is with Forbidden Lance because they just can't out it very well. So I'm maining two of that for now. Um, again, this is all stuff that requires more testing with how the format's going to develop in the future. But for now, post YCS, I think this is actually like very, very good. Also, like obviously plays around things like infinite permanence as well. Um, but yeah, then the consistency cards through duality through prosperity. Um, one copy of terraforming for the uh, magnificent map because you want more maps. Two copies of evenly match. I only play two because you don't want to open with it, obviously. Like this is a going first deck for like obviously, but. Uh, if you're going second, you're, like, you're not always going to go first, right? And uh, you want ways to get to this. So I only play two of it because you don't want to draw too many, but you also want to be able to duality and prosperity into it. Um, no decks really putting up good Omni Negates right now, unless they're like doing like a crazy uh, board in Kashira with like normal summoning Ash Blossom, which really does not come up a lot. So I think like just two of this card in the main deck is like perfectly reasonable. And then if you just draw one, you could just be a blowout going second or you could prosperity into it, which is just crazy. Um, and then moving forward, we have the two copies of Dreaming Town. Um, this card is just ridiculous right now. Like, with the way the format is, with how Kashdira operates and how Branded operates, without, like, with the, I should say, like, with the lack of Link monsters being in the meta, um, something like Dreaming Town has a very high good place in the meta, just because of, like, like, it just beats everything. With, like, Book, Book of Moon of Eclipse being so relevant, why wouldn't something like Dreaming Town being relevant in the graveyard effect, right? So this card is really excelling right now, in my opinion. So I think that this is like an excellent like roundabout way to beat the meta with like a way a flu could go moving forward. Um, now going into the side deck, uh, I play one copy of Dark Samorg and one copy of Snell. So these are like obviously cards that are searchable with Eaglin, but for going first against Labyrinth, I am playing Dark Samorg to be able to just summon it and then they cannot set their back row and then their deck is pretty much just turned off completely because their deck just doesn't work. Um, the only way that they can even attempt to out this card, right, is with, they have to go summon Ariana, get the, the Lady Labyrinth, and then special it in defense. And then at that point, they have to either wait a turn to beat, to ch attempt to attack over some Morg, or go into some kind of link play. But you're not just going to have Dark Sim work set up. You're going to have other cards as well. So that's just something that's, you know, very important to keep in mind. And then we have one copy of Snell. Now, this card was written off as terrible for so long, and I can honestly see why. Um, it doesn't do a lot, and I actually reread this card, and it's very interesting that how this card is worded. I never realized how it's worded, right? It's a, such a unique card. So I'm going to go over it just because I feel like a lot of people have the same interpretation of it that I do, and um, yeah, we're just going to talk about it together. So it's once per turn, while you control this Tribute Summon card, you can conduct three normal summoner sets, not just one. Keep in mind, this is not a on-summon effect. This is something that you can activate after you normal summon this card. Because it says, while you control this tribute summon card once per turn. It's just a normal ignition effect. Um, it's so weird that this is a card that has that effect like that. So, yeah, it's just once per turn while you control. So you can do, like, if you summon this on your opponent's turn, when the, the play comes back to you on the follow-up, you can activate this on your turn to just get three normal summons. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. I think that's, like, a very important thing that a lot of people don't know. Um, and then while you while this tribute summon card is in the monster zone, if, like, all your, uh, your birds get piercing. Like, it just gets piercing. That's... It's nothing crazy. Uh -huh. Like, all your monsters get piercing, which is kind of good. It doesn't come up a lot, but it's just something to keep in mind. And then this is the other effect, where once per turn during your opponent's turn, once, well, sorry, once per opponent's turn, I should say, uh, quick effect, you can banish one card from your hand, change all special summon monsters on your opponent controls to face down defense position. So this card is obviously in here for Kashtira, for this effect specifically. But again, this is an effect that doesn't activate when it's tribute summoned. This is something that is just a quick effect that you can do during your opponent's turn. 
So this is a card that you can actually summon on your own turn and set it up. And then during your opponent's turn, you can still use this to book down their guys. This isn't something you have to summon on your opponent's turn. You can just start with this. And so like, if you already have the Dreaming Town, you don't need to go for M-Pen. You can just go for Snow and just summon it. And it's already a threat to your opponent's board. And then it's just a quick effect. So like, this card operates a lot differently. So it's important to know that on Tribute Summon, this card doesn't do anything. It doesn't activate. It's just a bunch of effects that you can do during your turn and your opponent's turn. So that's just something to keep in mind. I never knew that, and I feel like a lot of people don't know that. So it's just something that I think is worth trying out and experimenting, especially in the Kestira. That's why it's in the side deck right now, because it's not, it doesn't excel against other decks, but it's really good against Kestira. So just something to keep in mind. I think it's very, very underestimated. Um, also, very randomly, that I actually am realizing right now, um, this is a soft once per turn. I just realized this right now. Um, so you can actually, like, there's probably a play line where you can do this in your opponent's turn, and if they're still trying to play, you can, like, go, like, Eaglin. Let me think about this. You can probably go, like, Eaglin into Guy, Tribute for M-Pen, and then do a line where you go into Street, banish it, Toucan, get it back, and then summon it again. And then you can do it again on your opponent's turn. That's actually crazy. I just realized that now. That's super cool. So I think this card is actually does have a place in this deck now, especially going first against Kashira. Like, yeah, that's just really good. I'm sorry. That, I just realized that right now. And this is so cool, like reading cards like this, um, like these niche interactions. So really cool card. Moving forward past that, finally, um, three copies of Enemy Controller. This card is really good for playing through Imperm Veiler and cards that like target banish like Fenrir and um, Arise Heart because you can just take their guy and then just use it as Tribute Fodder immediately. Um, yeah, that's just really, really good. So it's it like forces your effects through and puts a lot of pressure on boards before they even have a chance to like try to interact with Robina and Eaglin because they're off the field now and they're going to resolve still. So really, really good. Um, and then taking cards is really good, obviously. Like, I have the Gaia in here and the Zeus's. So, like, if you have a, a game state where you're not going to use your bird's effects, but you can take their guy and go for, like, a big Zeus play, um, that's also really important. That's also where something like the Arise Heart and the Extra Deck can come up. So just something to keep in mind with that. Uh, with the third Forbidden Lance, just in case for, like, again, this is for, like, uh, the Labyrinth deck because you know you want to be able to cards. And then with Eclipse being popular... Um, and Book of Moon being popular, this card can go and going first as well. Um, two copies of Talents. Again, this is something that's just really good right now. And looking at your opponent's hand to get perfect knowledge of where you need to interrupt them is super good. And um, yeah, this deck also plays around to beer like very well if you're just like playing it well. So just something to keep in mind. This doesn't have to be Talents either. There's like, there's so many ways you can play this right now. So I think it's really, really interesting. Um, we have one copy of Evenly Match, just the third one. Going second, this card is crazy. Again, with no Omni Negates, very good. Um, three copies of Featherstorm going first. This is like an FTK against so many decks. So yeah, broken card. And then three copies of Solemn Judgment because it's Judgment, good Omni Negate, and you can search it pretty much with Dualities and Prosperities. Super good. Um, also, this deck, like I just want to mention, uh, like if people are going the Ibli line, uh, this deck doesn't care. You're essentially just getting a free, <laughs> you're getting a free tribute like fodder on your side of the field, which is super cool. So they'll give you Ibli, if they don't know what you're playing, and then you just summon Eagle, and then it's already a threat to double tribute. So this is something to keep in mind. I think it's really cool. Extra deck, three copies of Zeus. Zeus is crazy right now. Again, like, you don't need any of these, right? Like, this is nothing in here this extra deck is mandatory because they come up so rarely. But when things do come up, it's important. It, it, they, they they can come up, so it's important to have them. Um, three Zeus, three Downerd, one Gaia, one... I'm not going to try to pronounce this, but you can read the name. Uh, two of the Assembled Nightingale, one of the Prominent Tail Thrush. This is just like a Spell and Traps Shuffler, which is pretty good. Two Nightmare Phoenix, uh, one Tri Brigade Farragut, and then one Omen. None of these cards are set in stone. Like, the extra deck never comes up. It's so rare, but it's important to have things like Zeus, Gaia, Downard, and like Arise Heart, I would say, are the most important cards just because you need to be able to out stuff. And like Nightmare Phoenix as well, if you get like, there can only be one, I would say. And like Zombie World, the people are still playing that, but it's not being played right now. So um, yeah, overall, I think this deck actually has like, with the way the format shaped up, I think this deck actually has like a very decent place in the meta that a lot of people just aren't accounting for with how the format's shaping up. And like, obviously this deck plays around Ash Blossom really well with the chain blocking and stuff too. So if you play it really well, I, I definitely see this deck like <laughs> having a place in the meta. I think it's crazy. But, um, overall, I hope you guys enjoyed this deck profile and the explanations. I think this deck can like really have a place in the meta if played well and built well. And um, yeah, again, I'm sorry for like saying this deck's budget with prosperity, but again, like I just cannot reiterate how important this card is um, in this deck. Like you can definitely, I'm, I don't even know the current price of prosperity. I thought it was like thirty dollars. It might be more now, but if it is thirty, like you can get this entire deck for like less than one fifty, and I think that's just like a very solid price for, in my opinion, a very strong competitive Yu-Gi-Oh deck. Um, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, again, please subscribe. I really appreciate it, and I will see you in the next video. See you later.